Do you hear me? Yes. Good. <laughs> allora. <laughs> Di nuovo vorrei ringraziare qualche persona. Uh, professore Roberto Zamboni, professore Alberto Credi per l'organizzazione e per l'invito. Uh, e anche la professoressa Margherita Venturi. Uh, and I will now switch to English. <coughs> yeah, it is. Okay? That's it. So if you don't mind, I will stay here, I mean, on the stage, but rather, you know, closer to the, to the people, because I feel very close to you. So we're going to talk about chemical topology and molecular machines, uh, which is a, a classical uh, title uh, for my lectures. And we will start with a bit of, uh, well, history, I'm not sure, but very old picture. Uh, when I came back from my postdoc and other things, uh, back to Strasbourg, uh, it was in the 70s, and uh, we disagreed about the date, so I prefer to put a question mark here. Uh, Jean-Marie thought it was in 1975 or 6, and I thought it was in 78 or 9. Uh, but anyway, I mean, we had very good relationship, as you can see. And I started my group in 19... 1979-1980. And just to tell you, um, we started, and as a young faculty, you know, I wanted to explore various uh, uh, fields, and we started several projects with a small group of people. Uh, well, it's more for fun, you know, but we started uh, in the field of catalysis, and uh, we developed some new catalysts based on rhodium and iridium, uh, rhodium-1 and iridium-3, which became iridium-1. Um, and they were very efficient catalysts for water gas shift reaction. Uh, we were very successful, in a way. I'm, I'm sorry to say that. I mean, it may sound a bit pretentious. Uh, but we found an incredible catalyst uh, for electrochemically reducing CO2. Uh, to carbon monoxide or even formic acid um, in water. And so that was the first time that CO2 could be electrochemically reduced in an aqueous medium without reducing water to H2. And it was even in daily newspapers. Uh, we were interested in, uh, uh, nowadays the people would say disensitized solar cells but at the time, you know, the people were just talking about sensitization uh, using copper complexes. Uh, with Dave McMillan, uh, we, had a, we started a, a very strong collaboration on new photosensitizers uh, based on copper, copper one. And even uh, in my group, uh, we did photochemical um, reduction of water to H2 in the big field of water splitting using copper complexes. Now we will switch to something else, and I will talk about cationanes uh, and molecular machines. So first, cationanes. Here you see uh, it is described as the archetype of topologically non-trivial molecule. Non-trivial molecule in terms of topology means that you cannot draw the molecule in a plane on a sheet of paper uh, without crossing points, regardless of the distortions you may impose uh, on the molecule or to the molecule. And this is exactly the point here. Uh, if you have two interlocking rings, you will always have two crossing points when you draw the molecule. 
even if you distort the rings as much as you like. These molecules have been dreamt of by chemists for many, many years. But uh, in 1964, uh, there was a very convincing uh, publication um, which appeared in Ungovernta Chemi. Uh, it was not Ungovernta Chemi International Edition. It was before uh, the English version um, uh, was proposed to the, the readers. And Professor Schill was able to make the catenane very convincingly. Um, it was a beautiful synthesis, very uh, intellectually extremely attractive. Uh, somewhat difficult and, and long and tedious, but a beauty, beautiful piece of work uh, which was probably greeted by the, the community. And uh, I was lucky enough to give a lecture uh, at the beginning of the year in uh, Freiburg, where Professor Schill uh, is living. Well, he's close to 90 years old and he's retired, but I felt very honored because he came to my lecture uh, with uh, Mrs. Schill, who was a biologist, and uh, we had a, a glass of wine together, long discussions. Um, well, it was a difficult time for me because we were speaking in German, and my German is really terrible, but still, how uh, we could interact. Uh, and you see they are in good shape. And I received a, an interesting uh, photograph uh, a couple of uh, months ago sent by Professor Marseven, I'm sure Ben knows him, in Amsterdam. And uh, this professor is a catenane person. He published some nice work on catenanes. And they had a barbecue uh, in uh, Freiburg or near Freiburg. And one of the students, uh, who is no more a student, uh, Luke uh, Stimmers, and Professor Schill are playing a classical game which is making a catenane with two human bodies. And this is really nice. So let, let me tell you how we started in this field. When I started my group, as you saw before, we were interested in several things. Uh, but probably the main topic, or one of the main topics, was photochemistry, inorganic photochemistry and trying to split the water molecule using light um, to split it to H2 and O2. And so, uh, at the time, uh, the, the most popular uh, photosensitizer uh, was ruthenium traced by pyridine. And no need uh, probably to say that uh, here in Bologna, Professor Balzani and his group has very strongly contributed uh, to the photochemistry and photophysics of ruthenium traced by pyridine, showing that uh, the excited state is a very good electron donor or a very good electron acceptor, even. And so this molecule was very popular. It was universally used for people or by people uh, interested in solar energy. And we thought that maybe ruthenium uh, leads to interesting properties, but it's a very expensive metal. Ruthenium is below iron in the uh, periodic uh, table, and it's a noble metal, and so we wanted to find something different, and uh, we were very much interested in first row transition metals, and in particular, uh, copper appeared to be uh, a very interesting candidate, very promising candidate. And we started a, a joint project with Dave McMillan, who was a young photochemist uh, working at the university, uh, at Purdue University in the US, in Indiana. Dave McMillan spent a year on sabbatical leave in Strasbourg. Uh, so that was an accident let's say, a very happy accident. And we started to interact, you know, and to collaborate. And uh, we had made this molecule, a very simple molecule, which surprisingly didn't exist before we made it. And we made it for various reasons. 
but with Dave McMillan, we started to make copper complexes with this compound. And so we made this molecule very, very easy. You take this compound, this organic compound, you mix with copper one, tetrakis acetonitrile, or any copper one salt, and within a minute, you have a beautiful deep red solution which contains this molecule, uh, pure, of course. It's a quantitative reaction. So that was the beginning. And Dave McMillan did all the photophysics uh, in his group with his um, team. Uh, and they found that it's an interesting complex. Uh, if you look at this complex, uh, it has a, uh, an interesting uh, absorption spectrum. Uh, it emits light. Uh, around 675 nanometers. And the most important, it has a long-lived uh, metal to ligand charge transfer excited state. Long-lived in the sense that it's only maybe uh, twice shorter than ruthenium 3 bp uh, The emission quantum yield was really poor. Uh, but in terms of photochemistry, I mean, it has no influence under the quantum yields of the photochemical reaction you are going to do later on. So that was a good start. Now, I will explain you how we started in the field of cationates. Looking carefully at this molecule, which we drew, you know, uh, it was before uh, uh, ChemDraw, before, even before computers, almost. And so we had to draw our molecule. And drawing your molecules helps you digest them. You, know, you digest their geometry, their structure, much, much better than using a software like Kendall. And we digested this molecule. And we realized that if we make a ring by connecting this point to this other point, the ring would be in a vertical plane. If we make another ring, now in a horizontal plane by interlinking this point and this other point, we make a catenane. The two rings are going to be interlocking with one another, and this will afford a catenane. And it, it was kind of a shock. You know, we thought, well, catenanes seem to be very difficult to make. Uh, we feel very comfortable in our field of inorganic photochemistry. Um, uh, inorganic photochemistry, yeah. uh, electrochemistry, CO2 activation, uh, homogeneous catalysis with iridium. But should we go on in this field, or since we have you know, a, a nice possibility for making catenanes, should we jump uh, in a new field? And we decided to jump. At the same time, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Christian Dietrich Buschecker, who studied uh, with me, so we knew each other for many years, uh, decided to join my group, and that was, of course, a very happy moment. Uh, she was an expert in synthesis, a great organic chemist, uh, and so we started to collaborate. Uh, I proposed her to work on the Catenane project. It was not so... Uh, so precise at the beginning, very uh, vague project, um, and it worked like a charm. You know, many people believe that when you start a project, a new project, it will take you five years or ten years before you get the first results. It took us ten months. And after ten months, we had our first publication in French, as Fraser uh, liked it, I think. I don't know where Fraser is. Yeah. In French, in uh, Tetrahedron Letters, which is not a high-impact journal, but you know the expression high-impact journal was totally unknown at the time. We didn't care about uh, impact. And, uh, and that was the first paper uh, describing the, let's say, practical synthesis of catenanes. So, uh, I have those drawings, you know, which I uh, made myself. Uh, but when I gave lectures with uh, former students of mine in the audience, they seemed to be terribly upset. You know. uh, they told me, well, 
you know, Euro drawings are really dusty, you know, they, uh, they are very old fashioned. And uh, we would like you to present rather animations rather than uh, old drawings. And so one of them uh, prepares some animation, and I will show you the animation. So this is the molecule. Now we have two uh, phenolic functions. Uh, we mix with uh, copper. Uh, we obtain this, very similar to what we have seen before with old-fashioned drawings. Uh, we cyclize on the right, cyclize on the left, and here we are. We have our ketamine. Um, we also use another strategy, which is probably more uh, general, uh, because you can make asymmetric uh, ketanines. So you start from a ring. Uh, now you will mix with copper, add a second organic component. So this is again the molecule. Copper arrives, the second component arrives, and finally you cyclize. And it worked uh, very efficiently. Uh, the yields were um, quite poor at the beginning, something like 25 to 30 percent. Uh, but by uh, improving, improving, improving uh, the process and the, the methodology, uh, we could reach uh, the, the value of 92% for making a ketamine. Uh, we got an X-ray structure for the copper complex for the, the demetallated species, and here are the X-ray structures. Uh, you have a very compact structure for the copper complex with lots of pi-pi uh, interactions, stacking interactions. And for the metal-free species, it's a much more open structure. Uh, it is very flexible, and we could show by NMR uh, mostly that the two rings can more or less glide freely uh, within each other. So that was the beginning. Well, so let me pay homage to the Catanane people, and I just listed uh, the, the groups I consider as real pioneers in this work, in this field. Uh, so Fraser will uh, probably introduce you to uh, their concept of pi-pi uh, uh, stacking and hydrogen bonding, and, and hydrogen bonding. This is very important. Uh, two uh, groups also use hydrogen bonding as a um, uh, template. Uh, Chris Hunter, Fritz Fuckle. So Chris Hunter was in Sheffield. Uh, Fritz Fuckle was in Bonn, the University of Bonn. And uh, very sadly, he passed away not so long ago. Uh, Makoto Fujita used uh, palladium nitrogen bonds, which are very labile to make catenanes. And I think that was the beginning. Until, let's say, the mid 90s. Uh, <coughs> Few people were interested in catenates. Let me spend a few minutes on something which we, uh, we were really very happy to work on, uh, which is the making of the trefoil knot. So the trefoil knot, it's an interesting topology. This is the first non-trivial knot in, in mathematics, in topological mathematics. Uh, it has three crossings, necessarily. And uh, maybe you know, but there are many, many knots which have been identified by mathematicians. And this is, as I said, the first non-trivial knot. And the way we made this compound was uh, mostly generalizing uh, the, the strategy we had used for making a catenane. Um, now we start with uh, a molecular filament, let's say, or string containing two coordinating uh, units uh, in this bump here, in this other bump here, we have a coordinating unit ready to interact with copper. So we mix with the metal. We obtain a double-stranded helix. Uh, and now we cyclize. We go from here to here, from here to here. And we obtain a trefoil knot. So this is already the trefoil knot. Uh, if you distort it, uh, you will obtain, let's say, a more classically represented trefoil knot, but this should work. And so we embarked in this project, and we spent 
about four years uh, without any result, any positive results. Uh, but finally, Christian Dietrich being an extremely stubborn and uh, fantastic uh, um, chemist, uh, she could obtain tiny amounts of a trefoil knot after, um, let's say, many negative attempts. So here we have a CH24 linker between those two units. We mix with copper in stoichiometric proportion, and we obtain this intermediate, which is a double-stranded helix, and we will cyclize, go from here to here, separately from here to here, and we will obtain the threshold knot. I didn't indicate the yield here, because I'm sure you would laugh, you know, and uh, having an audience laughing, you know, and even laughing at you is never pleasant, but the yield was miserable. Uh, so this is the knot we made. Again, it's a single closed curve, only one curve, only one cycle, uh, but it's a knotted uh, cycle. We got an X-ray structure, which is uh, shown here. Uh, just for you, perhaps, to visualize better, if we start from here, we will travel all along the curve and cross here over the other uh, fragment, uh, under and over, we continue the journey, under, over, under, and we come back to the starting point. So we have an alternating situation of crossings, over, under, over, under, and it's a single closed curve. Uh, incidentally, uh, the, the, the knots we crystallized, uh, we have a series of knots we, which crystallized, uh, most of them were undergoing spontaneous resolution. That's a bit tricky. I don't really know why. So this is the compound. The two coppers are exactly where you expect them to be. And uh, everything was fine. I should say that the years were multiplied by um, large factors, uh, by uh, modifying the structures, and we went up to 75%. Again, after 10 years or so, uh, we could obtain really large amounts of such species. And I will just now show you that these species are um, somewhat tricky, uh, and, they, and we found something by accident. But I think it is something really uh, novel. Uh, if we start from the dye copper, uh, knotted species, when we use potassium cyanide to demethylate, and you know that cyanide uh, binds avidly to copper, so copper will be uh, kicked out the system very efficiently, very rapidly, uh, and you generate copper cyanide, which is uh, totally insoluble. Uh, if you use potassium as counter ion, uh, the potassium ions will be very happy to interact with OCH2, CH2O fragments, similarly to crown eaters or cryptans or cryptates. And so what you do is you invert completely the structure. So you are here with your uh, OCH2, CH2O fragments lying at the periphery of the molecule. And when you remove the copper, uh, the potassium ions will enter the game and they will now generate a new complex with what was at the periphery originally is now inside in the inner part of the molecule. And the, the aromatic fragments, namely the phenethylene fragments, are now pushed away and they lie at the periphery of the system. And this is perfectly reversible. It is some kind of complete inversion. And as far I, as I know, there are not so many systems like that. Uh, so, again, the X-ray structure, uh, the calculated structure of the dipotassium complex, uh, that's what we have seen before. This is the same structure as the one we have seen. Now you add potassium cyanide, it's quantitative, and you generate a completely new species. Uh, so you can call it a complete metamorphosis. And this is, again, reversible.
Now let me talk about molecular machines for um, a bit of time. Uh, just, uh, I mean, these are my comments. Um, most of the synthetic molecules are uh, considered as uh, static, meaning that they undergo motion, but these motions are completely random motions, stochastic or random. Um, although there are exceptions, and in particular, um, photochemically driven motions based on um, azobenzene. Uh, and of course, you will see the, the fantastic work of um, uh, Professor Feringa. But in biology, controlled molecular motions are absolutely essential, and they are omnipresent. And that was some kind of source of inspiration uh, knowing that in biology you have rotary motors, linear motors, even uh, walkers like kinesin um, walking on microtubules. And so this is a very large family of molecules called motor proteins, and they are everywhere. So you have to think that inside your body you have billions and billions of rotary motors working permanently, or linear motors, or walkers, um, and, uh, of course, this is certainly very challenging, trying to repeat similar functions uh, using synthetic systems. Two examples, ATP synthase, this very famous and universal rotary motor, uh, which uh, appeared in uh, living organisms uh, 3.7 billion years ago in the most primitive organisms, archaeas, and kinesin walk, walking on a microtubule, uh, but we have no time to discuss that more in detail. Now, cationanes and rotaxanes are very well adapted uh, to um, making molecular machines, uh, and uh, clearly, if you have a rotaxane, uh, you can easily figure out that the ring, which is here on the left part of the axis, uh, could be moved to the right and go back to the left. Here you could think of uh, rotary systems, or at least pirouetting systems, if you are not able to control directionality. So these systems are really um, nice, potentially very nice precursors uh, to the synthesis of molecular machines. So just a few names here uh, who are, again, the, the pioneers, uh, Fraser, Vincenzo, Alberto Margherita. Uh, Professor Harada in Osaka has also published beautiful work based on uh, cyclodextrins. Uh, David Lee, also um, fantastic work. Uh, some um, molecular shuttles, Nakashima. And, and many other people, uh, just uh, without being too chauvinist or chauvinistic, um, Nicola Giuseppone in Strasbourg uh, is doing beautiful work on uh, um, molecular machines and devices made out of molecular machines. Now let me talk about the very first uh, molecular machine we made in Strasbourg, which is a cationane, and it's an electrochemically driven system. Quite simple, in a way almost naive. So we start from copper one, and we make a cationane with copper one at the center. And you know that copper one is D10. Uh, copper one is not really a transition metal, and it is very happy if you have a tetrahedral geometry. Copper one uh, will form a very stable complex uh, in these conditions with two phenanthrolines here arranged as a tetrahedron of nitrogen atoms. But now we have introduced something else, a terpyridine, three pyridines here, at the back of the molecule, and we will send a signal. We will send a perturbation to the molecule, which is abstracting an electron from copper one to generate copper two. Copper two is D9. It's a real transition metal. So you have to take into account ligand field, and copper two hates to be tetrahedrally coordinated. 
Copper 2 wants to be 5 coordinate or 6 coordinate with the Jan Teller distortion. And of course, this species here is only an intermediate because it is exceedingly unstable. So what will happen is quite clear. The ring will glide here, and the three nitrogen atoms which were originally at the periphery uh, here will replace the two nitrogen atoms of the phenanthaline so as to generate a very stable copper two complex. Now you have one, two, three, four, five nitrogen atoms. It's a, a square pyramid. This has been shown uh, later on. Uh, and you have a very stable complex. You can go back. We reduce copper two to copper one. We generate a very unstable five coordinate copper one and very rapidly the system rearranges and you obtain a stable copper one complex, exactly the same as the one you started from. Just a quick point here. If you look at the redox potentials, they are quite different, which is very, very obvious. Uh, you stabilize copper one here, so you have to apply a positive potential. You stabilize copper two here, so that you have to apply a slightly negative potential. And we were very much interested in hysteresis. So that was the project, in a way, to have electrochemical hysteresis with molecules. And clearly, hysteresis um, is linked to motion. I mean, this is known for decades and decades. Uh, if you look at magnetic hysteresis with uh, solids, molecular solids, motion is very important. Uh, and so that was the, the idea. I have a, a small video, again, Sylvester Bonnet, who is a, now an associate professor in Leiden. Uh, so we abstract an electron, we generate copper two, the system rearranges, you obtain your five coordinate copper two complex, very stable, and you can go back uh, to copper one, four coordinate copper one, etc. And this can be done as many times as you like, either in the computer or with the molecules. We have never um, detected any fatigue, any degradation with these molecules. So the system was very slow to, uh, uh, to, to move. Uh, and uh, so we improved the system. Uh, I think it's a great classic. It, it was a great classic in our group. You find something uh, which, uh, with a poor yield uh, or something which is very, very slow, very sluggish. Uh, and then you have to work on it maybe for five years, 10 years to improve the system and get something uh, which is more satisfactory. And so this is exactly what we did. Uh, so we converted the original seconds to minutes to microseconds to milliseconds by modifying some structural um, parameters. Um, and that was, of course, um, um, a success. So there is a weak point here. And let me uh, make it clear. The weak point is that we are not uh, dealing with a rotary motor. We have no control over directionality. And so we can call it a pirouetting rotaxane or a pirouetting uh, catenane. Uh, but it, it, by no means, you know, it's, it's a rotary motor. And if you want to, uh, if you're interested in rotary motors, but I think I can skip that, uh, Ben, if you agree. It's in all my lectures, you know, all my lectures. But uh, this time, I think I can skip it. Uh, so let me finish up by uh, uh, giving, you, giving you two other examples of uh, molecular machines we made in our group. So we have been very much interested in uh, making a molecular muscle, uh, something which behaves in a way similar to uh, our muscles, biological muscles. Uh, first, we have to know how they work in biology. Uh, so a muscle, the striated muscle, let's say, um, functions by gliding filaments along one another. It is totally different from a spring, you know, a metal spring. 
in which you introduce strain. Uh, no, you just glide filaments. Uh, the thin filaments, which are polymers, actin polymers, will glide and move towards the center of this uh, small thing here, which is a sarcomere, the tiniest part of a muscle. And the thick filament, the myosin here, will have an ATP um, activity, ATP uh, hydrolysis activity. And so uh, you consume ATP while those uh, red filaments move toward the center, which means contraction. And once you have contracted, if you want to relax, you just do nothing. You know that relaxation doesn't cost you any energy. So it's, it's spontaneously, it will go back to this form. So a muscle represents a system uh, for which filaments are gliding along one another. And um, so we were what, what we made, but we have no time to discuss in detail, but what we made uh, was a system of this type. It's a rotaxane dimer. So we have a deep blue ring here, threaded by a pale blue filament. Uh, this pale blue filament is attached to a pale blue ring itself, threaded by the deep blue, uh, dark blue filament. And we could show that by sending chemical signals, uh, we can contract from 8 nanometers at the beginning to 6 nanometers in the contracted form and go back to 8 nanometers. And it's very clean. It's a chemical signal, so it is, uh, let's say, less elegant and less promising than uh, an electrochemical signal. Um, but still, I mean, it was uh, one, the, one of the first systems and nowadays, uh, several groups have done beautiful work uh, using um, things which can contract or elongate. Uh, Giuseppe Perne in Strasbourg, uh, recently uh, Professor Feringa and, and others. Well, this is now the very last example which I show you. Well, I like also to show it to you because of you know, the, the synthesis, the complexity. First, let me refer to a beautiful piece of work uh, done by those um, uh, four, no, five, five scientists, um, uh, which is the elevator. So the, the molecular elevator is very famous, not only in Bologna, uh, but also all over the world. Uh, when it was published, it was probably one of the most sophisticated molecular machines, so to say. Uh, because of the number of components. Um, in terms of topology, you know, it's nothing. I mean, I don't want to be insulting, you know, but it's simply a two rotaxane. Uh, but there are many components. Uh, in each filament here, you have two stations. So this is the elevator in the upper situation uh, with the platform in the higher uh, position. But of course, it can move. Well, I'm not going to discuss that <laughs> for sure. Uh, but we made another rotaxane, which was um, somewhat complex. And the project was trying to make a compressor. So this is a four rotaxane. We have two dumbbells here, two axes, uh, threaded through rings. And those rings are, are arranged as a bis macrocycle here. The same this macrocycle here, and uh, two plates. And those two plates are porphyrins. And we knew that uh, between these porphyrins, we should be able to insert something, to have a small molecule able to, uh, to be trapped, let's say, between these two porphyrins. And the idea was uh, entrapping um, molecules between those two plates here, and then compressing, trying to uh, bring those two plates to closer proximity and to see whether we could compress what was inside the guest here. So the, <coughs> the, the project, you know, we had drawn the molecule here. Uh, I, I had drawn the molecule here. 
I should say. So you have the two dumbbells here and uh, the beast macrocycle, which is here, the other beast macrocycle. And you see you have zinc porphyrins, pink zinc porphyrins. And when I drew that and I spoke to the people in my group, you know, uh, they were not very enthusiastic. They thought that it would be exceedingly difficult to make such a molecule. And honestly, they were wrong. Because of symmetry. Because of symmetry, because of the, the magic uh, effect of copper, able to um, gather all the, the important fragments to pre-orient them in space, uh, it works much, much more easily than expected. I skipped the synthesis. We could obtain an X-ray structure of that species. It's a relatively big molecule, as you can see here. Uh, so this is exactly like uh, what you've seen before on the drawing. Uh, the two porphyrins are here, uh, zinc ions, white, and water molecules for the moment. And we could insert small molecules in between the zinc porphyrins uh, because zinc is a Lewis acid and it can interact with Lewis bases like um, amines or pyridines, and so we could insert small species inside. So this is the molecule. And now, um, something we didn't plan, you know, as, so it was, it was kind of serendipity, but we, we, we will remove the coppers. The copper, uh, here the four copper ions, maintain the geometry uh, as indicated here, you have a, a very long rect rectangle. Uh, so this is the X-ray structure. And uh, we will remove the copper ions. And we had triazoles here. here we, we had four triazoles. And those triazoles will like to interact with zinc. And that was not planned. So just for you to see, this is the last scientific slide. Uh, now we remove the copper, very easy, and the triazoles will now interact with zinc. And you flatten completely the system, and the molecules which were um, in between the two plates are slowly compressed and finally expelled. And of course, if you add copper again, quantitatively, you regenerate the starting form of the molecule. So we thought this is a kind of a compressor and at the same time a switchable receptor because uh, uh, you have either a receptor here which forms stable complexes, very stable complexes, or you have something which is totally unable uh, to complex anything. I believe my time is not completely over. Uh, let me again uh, say something I said yesterday. Uh, we had an extremely important collaboration with Bologna, um, and uh, I didn't count the number of publications you know, exactly, but it's probably in the same range as um, with Fraser Stoddart. Uh, I think we are 70, we had 70 publications together, um, some of them with uh, Vincenzo's group, uh, some others with uh, um, Lucia and uh, Francesco. Well, I spoke about your work, actually, uh, Lucia, yesterday, on the, the Iridium work. And uh, it has always been a great, great pleasure uh, to collaborate, to visit you, to interact. And I'm very, very grateful to the, the people who collaborated with us. Um, well, let me finish up by saying that uh, before the emergence of molecular machines, um, molecules were mostly considered as still objects. Um, so things have completely changed. Um, I would also like to say that um, what I spoke about today was not done by me, you know. Uh, so we had lots of discussions in my group, but there were fantastic um, scientists, 
uh, professional scientists, university professors, and CNRS uh, professors. And so this is the list of people whose role has been absolutely determining. Uh, and this is the good thing of the French system. If you can adapt to it, uh, to work as teams of professional people, teams of friends, people who know each other very, very well, uh, who are very happy to arrive in the morning in the lab because they know they will meet friends. And I think this is probably one of the keys to our uh, relative success. There were also many students, uh, many postdocs, and uh, I'm afraid we have no time uh, to, to name them uh, all. And uh, finally, uh, let me thank my university, the French CNRS. Uh, we always uh, had support from the European communities. They were very generous with us. Uh, I'm really embarrassed to say that because today, um, obtaining an ERC is uh, almost uh, impossible. Uh, but at the time, it was much easier to get funds from the European community. I have a new institute in which I'm now working. Uh, I spent uh, a couple of years part-time uh, at Northwestern University, mostly thanks to Fraser, uh, who arranged for me to, to visit. Uh, my good friend and mentor, Jean-Marie Lane, I'd like to thank him, of course, uh, for showing me, in a way, for, for being a model, you know, a totally unreachable model to me. Uh, but the way he used to manage his group was uh, very nice, you know, friendly, um, very direct, I mean, no hierarchy. Um, with Malcolm Green, I learned transition metal chemistry, organometallics. I had two great teachers. I'd like to thank my family and my two good friends, Fraser and Ben. And finally, thank you for your attention. Thank you.